on the next edition of Art Rocks, a late Charles jazz musician who is learning from the best of the best. It just blew my mind and I couldn't get my mind off of it. I wanted to go to Berkeley. We delve into the work of an overlooked master artist. He is responding very directly to what's going on in Paris. This extraordinary new urban landscape that has been essentially constructed during his young lifetime. Meet a Sacramento fashion photographer who is capturing the look on runways across America. I just think each person has their own gifts that they've been given. And watch as a Florida gentleman breathes enchantment into a handful of ordinary balloons. I like to stick a lot to Looney Tunes and it depends on the shape of the characters too. That's all ahead on Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello and thank you for joining us for Art Rocks. I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine. Now from Zydeco to blues, swamp pop to jazz, Louisiana has a history of producing and exporting great musicians. Well, Lake Charles has one in the making. His name is Jairus Daigle, a jazz violinist who earned his musical chops alongside his father Chester, who is a well-known pianist on the Lake Charles live music scene. But with a scholarship to the Berklee College of Music, this young prodigy has also been influenced by some of the finest music minds in the world. I started playing violin at the age of seven, and I've been playing violin ever since, and I'm still playing violin. But uh, throughout my journey through music, I've picked up other instruments such as uh, the alto saxophone, uh, the marching French horn, and also uh, a little bit of piano, drums, and pretty much anything I get my hands on. You might say that music is in Jarrah's blood. His father, Chester, is also an accomplished musician. I've been playing piano from the age of seven, classically trained, and, and I discovered jazz along the way. It's, it's all natural. I, I refer my, to myself as a working musician. I'm, I'm not a star. I like working behind prominent people. I've played with James Brown, Sly Stone, Jeff Beck, Chester was also called in to play piano for Jennifer Holliday when her regular musician didn't show up for a performance in Houston, Texas. Though there was no time to rehearse, Holliday was so impressed by Chester's talent, she contacted him again for a leading role with her Broadway hit, Dream Girls. My role it was as an assistant conductor. The assistant conductor's role is to make sure that the pit orchestra is rehearsed, make sure that all of the musical arrangements are correct. And I was also in, in charge of all of the keyboard instruments. Jarris is the youngest of five children in the Daigle family, and he may have benefited most when his father lost his vision, which kept him close to home. I still have my R&B band that works in the area, uh, City Heat. We, we still work together. I still perform with Jairus a couple of times a week. In addition to performing with his father while growing up, Jairus was also able to hone his music skills at the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts. Just as he was graduating from high school, the teenager got a chance to spend five weeks at one of the most prestigious music schools in the country, the Berklee College of Music. It just blew my mind and I couldn't get my mind off of it. I wanted to go to Berklee. So the next thing was, how am I going to get there? So I went to try it out, and they accepted me. The Daigle family knew there was no way they could afford to pay for Berkeley, even though Jarris had been offered a modest scholarship. So they applied for the Horatio Alger Scholarship. Jarris learned he was a runner-up, but not the winner of the scholarship, during a break while performing in a Lake Charles restaurant. 
It just so happened that Lake Charles businessman William Dore recognized his talent and also recognized his name while watching him perform. Mr. Dore put me through college in a very prestigious music college, not just any college. And I thank him for that. And he's still uh, supporting me in my career. And he has lots of faith in me. And I thank him for that as well. After he graduated from Berkeley, he had recorded these two albums. And I said, okay, now what you need to do is get you a group of young guys together and y'all go out there and, you know, do concerts and get this ball rolling. And I said, okay, who's the keyboard player going to be? He said, you. <laughs> and, you know, so I accepted that. And my son that's next to him in age, Chester, he's the other keyboard player. And how does a young man with a prestigious education from Berkeley feel about performing with his dad? <laughs> I still uh, find myself looking up to him and being inspired by his playing and just very excited to hear him play behind me. It's, it's just times where we'll be playing together and he'll take his solo and I have to just sit there and admire what he's doing on the keys and just sit there and smile and watch him because I know that I'm learning a lesson just by hearing him play. In addition to performing with his band, Lake Charles Finest, the young musician has other goals as well. I plan on um, releasing more albums. I plan on beginning a career as a studio musician, uh, getting more into the orchestra, um, also giving back to communities such as my own Lake Charles by teaching students and uh, doing whatever I can to help students get more into music, into music making, producing, education, or whatever they want to do. I want to inspire more students to go and carry out a career in music if that's what they want to do. Listen to one of Jairus' solo albums and you'll agree you've never heard violin like this before. No matter where you live in Louisiana, opportunities to connect with the arts are everywhere, if only you know where to look. So here's a list of standout events in the week to come. To learn more about these and other events in Louisiana, visit lpb.org slash artrocks or pick up a free copy of Country Roads magazine. LPB's Art Rocks website also features an archive of previous episodes, so to see any segment again, just log on to lpb.org. Turning now to an impressionist painter who possessed a master's touch. Although his creations are often overlooked, it's the work of Gustave Caillebout. Mary Morton, the curator and head of the French Paintings Department at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., guides us through the artist's life and introduces his works. Gustav Kaibat was an Impressionist painter, which is to say that he participated in the Impressionist exhibitions, which occurred between 1874 and 1882. He was considered to be the leader of the movement for several of those years. He was younger than Monet and Pizarro and Sisley and Cezanne and Renoir, but he brought a very sort of particular kind of vision to the movement. He dies young, and he is independently wealthy, and so he doesn't sell his work during his life.
lifetime, and there's really not much of a market immediately after his death in 1894. His pictures remain in his family for about a century, and then they start to, to come out in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. There are still not many paintings by Kaibot in public collections. Because he was wealthy and didn't have to sell his paintings, Kayabat has never captured the popular imagination, as did his peers, such as Monet and Renoir. But he recorded a moment in time when Paris was undergoing a rapid transformation from a medieval warren of narrow streets to the grand boulevards it is known for today. He is responding very directly to what's going on in Paris this extraordinary new urban landscape that has been essentially constructed during his young lifetime, so across the 1850s and 60s. Bringing together 55 works from collections around the world, this exhibition expresses the beginning of modernist painting. His first ambitious painting is the floor scrapers, or Les Raboteurs, and he submits it, because he's on the track to be an artist, to the Salon. sweaty, hot, boring, difficult work. There's a gigantic bottle of wine that's opened to the side of one of them. It's, um, they're gonna drink their way through it. Class tensions are running high in Paris at the time, and the salon is not ready for a off-kilter look at the laboring classes. The salon rejects the painting. So he takes that picture the next year and hangs it with the renegade group known as the Impressionists in 1876, and it causes a huge um, response. But it is Kayabat's next work that will prove to be his most acclaimed. Ignoring the bright palette of the other Impressionists, he portrays the city of light in an unidealized way, overcast and drizzling. He exhibits Paris Street Rainy Day, in the third Impressionist exhibition. And it's big, and he knew that it would make a major statement, and it did, and it's all critics talked about. The umbrellas are fantastic, and they're utterly uniform, because everybody has gone to the department store and bought their black umbrella imported from the UK. There's a wonderful group of portraits. These are pictures of his friends, of his buddies, the people he hung out with. They're really portraits of, of his social milieu, um, that great painting of the guys playing cards in his apartment that he shared with his brother in his bachelor pad. There's an amazing group of still life paintings of things that he would have seen in his very fancy neighborhood in the 9th arrondissement on the sidewalks in the fancy uh, fruit and vegetable and butcher stores. The one that is taking, literally taking people's breath away is the butcher uh, shop picture from Chicago called Calf's Head and Ox Tongue, which is a, um, a pretty gory uh, example of contemporary um, industrial butchery and I think one of the most amazing still lifes of the entire century. He plays with space in almost every one of his canvases. It was something that intrigued him and that he turned in an expressive way to get at a particular kind of emotional, psychological tension. was rich and supported his fellow painters because he loved what they were doing. He bought their work and ended up with one of the greatest private collections of Impressionism. Today, beyond his contribution as a benefactor of other Impressionists, Kayabat is being reevaluated as an important painter in his own right for the way he captured the moment Paris began to pivot toward the modern age.
Traveling now to Sacramento, California to train our lens on fashion photographer Mark Gunter and get a glimpse into his world. Gunter says that making memorable fashion images isn't just a matter of getting the right shot, it's also about creating the perfect brand. If you can capture them as they're looking like into your eyes, or I'm looking into their eyes, then you'll capture an amazing picture. As a child growing up, my mother was involved in art and dancing and photography. She used to model as well. It was when I picked up a camera one day and I took a picture of my mother when she was going out one night in the 70s. She had her afro, had a nice outfit on, and I said, let me take a picture of mommy before she went out. I still have that picture to this day, but that's my first time that I ever picked up a camera you know, taking pictures of family pictures and kids. But then I was in the military. I was doing a lot of traveling, going overseas, deploying to the wars. I was in the Gulf War. Came back and I was a color sergeant. So we were always taking pictures and we were doing inspector general's inspection. So I was always behind the camera. So it was a good experience getting the real exposure within the community and I enjoyed it. It became a hobby at that particular time. It was when I first got introduced to runway photography and high fashion photography at Sacramento Fashion Week in 2013. And that's when I found the passion for runway photography. And then from that point forward, I said, in the future, I want to be one of the runway photographers. For the last three years, I've been educating myself. The planning process is knowing the environment, knowing how the lighting is going to be, a lot's going through my eye. I hear a lot of cameras. <laughs> click, 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 click. I don't try to take a lot of pictures. I just try to become one with the model at the same time when they're walking down the runway, following their footsteps as they're walking, as well as capturing the best shot possible. <laughs> that one shot that could take you to the next level. It was always my dream to go shoot in New York after I shot SAC Fashion Week in 2013. And I went to New York, shot New York Fashion Week, the Fashion Gallery. It was an amazing experience, shot 23 designers. About two years ago, I came in contact with Sheen Magazine, received a phone call, and they needed some assistance. Being a part of Sheen Magazine, pretty much is like being in a family. We pretty much all go on the road together and travel. It's an experience to be on the road and do editorial photo shoots at the same time because it gives you another perspective. It's very interesting. Once, once you get out there, you see and meet a lot of different photographers. When I'm out there, they always say to me, who's that guy? Why is he dressed up? And I say, it's my signature. You have to look at it as a professionalism. If it's not more or less just your name, it's your brand at the same time that you're going to be representing. So when I'm out, I want to represent not only myself, but I represent the community as well and others that are around me. So I want to make sure I'm sharp as much as possible. I've seen a lot. By traveling from Sacramento to LA to New York, it's different in every city that you travel and go to. Getting to know the people that I'm working with, whether it's all the way from knowing the makeup artist, knowing the hairstylist, knowing the, the clothing stylist, knowing the designer, knowing the production crew. I would say that's one of the key components. I just think each person has their own gifts that they've been given, and then they learn from each other. It's just having a passion to enjoy yourself. Like when I'm sitting there with my camera, as soon as I look through the lens, I know I have the shot. There's something magical about a photograph's power to unite mood, model and moment and to convey all three to the audience. Mark's work might make all that look easy, but you know it's anything but. Bringing you back home now for our Louisiana Treasures segment. Today we're on our way to the iconic courthouse that presides over Clinton, an East Feliciana parish town 35 miles north of Baton Rouge with a long and colourful history. 
It's the oldest fully functioning courthouse in the United States. The builder was Lafayette Saunders. It took him about a year to complete. And in September of 1840, the building was completed. He also uh, built the entirety of Lawyer's Row, which is on the north side of the courthouse. This structure is an example of classical Greek Roman architecture and has 28 columns that extend out from the building and the roof actually extends out and it makes a very simple walkway around the, every side of the building. The walls on the first floor are three feet thick. So it's a really strong structure. The building for the last 30, 35 years has been crumbling from within. We were at a breaking point and it was either, you know, the building was gonna be too far gone or we could get it fixed. We're so thankful for the generosity of one of our families in the parish, the Pennington family came through and they recognized the need that we had and they actually helped us kickstart a campaign to restore the courthouse. Almost everything that you see uh, today is original to the courthouse or, or almost exactly how it was in 1840. One of our main goals was to make sure that everything was as it was back when it was built. Uh, we found remnants of the cloth at the, uh, at the judge's bench and at the bailiff's bench and we actually had the cloth tested and we found that the supplier of that cloth was still in business today and we actually got the same cloth that well, was done back in the 1840s. A lot of the flooring in the uh, courtroom is the same as it was back in 1840. A lot of these oaks are original to the building and we just we take a lot of pride in them. How inspiring to find historic buildings that are not just preserved but still relevant to the fabric of public life because as we know they just don't build them like they used to. Now finally from Sarasota, Florida, Bobby the Balloon Man is full of hot air. That's a compliment, because although Bobby has been creating inspired balloon art since 1989, he continues to hone his craft, finding new ways to delight generations of kids and the adults that they've become. Here's his story. <laughs> I started twisting balloons back in 1989, so I'm going on 25 years. I work as a professional clown, a Scooter the Clown, and I put myself through college doing birthday parties and special events. You know, it's funny, I always wanted to learn just for my own entertainment. I taught myself how to juggle and ride a unicycle when I was 17, just because I wanted to learn. I learned how to do some magic tricks volunteering in a magic shop when I was 14 years old and I always wanted to learn how to do balloons. One time I was at the mall and I remembered to go into the bookstore and see if they had a book on how to do these and they had a little book with a kit, you know, it came with a bag of balloons and a little hand pump and it was pretty easy for me. I took to it very quickly. Right now we're at Mi Pueblo. Uh, in Sarasota, and I'm here twice a week. I'm here every Friday and Saturday night. Doing balloons in a restaurant is more than just going up to the tables and making a balloon for a kid. You have to be courteous to the management, the servers. You have to be aware of the customers. Um, if I'm working at a table and the table next to me just got sat, I'm not going to go to that table first. I have to kind of be aware of customers that are almost done with their meals who may have not gotten balloons. And, and, and so sometimes customers think that you're ignoring them, but you actually have to work around and try to hit everybody. If I just stay in one area, a lot of tables will turn over and customers will leave unhappy. <laughs> I go up to the tables and I offer them the option of a list of simple things that they can pick from or a fancy surprise. I like to try to spend anywhere from five to ten minutes at a table, maybe fifteen tops. So if, if they have nine kids there, I try to keep it to the simple stuff so that I'm not there for 45 minutes. There's certain, certain characters that take 20 minutes or more for me to make. I, I have no intentions of like working so fast to where I hurt my hands, and that is an issue, by the way. I'm um, doing this for so many years, pains start to set in, and the knuckles and hands, and so I don't want to work too fast. I have to try to keep it to characters that I know I can do within five to seven minutes. 
I have uh, like a, an, a comfortable repertoire of maybe 15 to 20 when I'm working in a restaurant that I just kind of recycle. Um, I like to stick a lot to Looney Tunes and it depends on the shape of the characters too. Like sometimes I'll look at a character and I'll say, I can, I can figure that one out. And that's kind of an incentive for me to play. This is one of those things where I think that if I won the lottery, I'd still do. This is so therapeutic. I'm a licensed elementary school teacher, and even though that can be rewarding, it's also stressful at times. When I am doing this kind of work, I can interact with the kids in a different way and be more playful. It's not all down to business. So it's, it's very therapeutic. I think this is a fun hobby for anybody to pick up. It's like playing with Legos, except you're basically just making pieces out of balloons and putting them together. I recommend for people to give it a try if they want to do something creative. If you think about popping the balloons, make sure you get a good quality. Uh, there are certain stores that sell very cheap ones. Those balloons won't do. They're going to keep popping no matter what. But I think that people who want to try it should try it. If you're looking at something that you're trying to create out of balloons, like for instance, when I did the Janet Reno balloon, that took some creativity and that, that is art. There are some balloon artists who think that drawing on the balloons is cheating. I, that's, that's their opinion and they're, that's okay, you know. Uh, I think that anything you want to add to the balloon is art. It's your art. You, you're the creator. Uh, some people use glue to put the balloons together. Other balloon artists think that's cheating. You know, <laughs> but art is art. It's whatever you create and whatever you're happy with. So that'll do it for this edition of Art Rocks. But remember, you can always watch episodes of the show at lpb.org slash art rocks. And if you want more, Country Roads Magazine is a unique resource that brings the best of our state's events, arts, history, culture and cuisine all within reach. Published monthly, distributed widely. Find a copy at countryroadsmag.com. Until next week, I'm James Fox Smith and thanks for watching.